In 1975, a young engineer at Nestle visited a coffee bar in Rome. Shortly after, he would invent the world's most convenient cup of coffee. And with the help of George Clooney, he would globalize the concept of the coffee pod. This is the story of Nestle's Nespresso and why it's so much worse than you thought. Eric Favre was born in Switzerland sometimes before the 1960s. After completing his secondary education, he went on to study at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, a public research university in Lausanne, Switzerland, where he would receive a degree in engineering. In 1975, Eric was hired to work at Nestlé's headquarters in Vevey, Switzerland, a job that would change both his life and the lives of coffee enthusiasts around the world. One of the first projects Eric worked on was the development of a machine that could take the convenience of self-made coffee and merge it with the quality of an Italian espresso bar that had customers shilling out more money for expertly crafted coffee prepared using large, expensive equipment. In order to appeal to the customers, Eric's new machine had to taste better than low-quality instant coffee but offer an easier brewing experience than laborious roast and ground coffee. Inspiration would strike in Rome. In 1975, the same year that he had begun work at Nestle, Eric found himself wandering the streets of central Rome. It was one particular spot, a coffee bar amidst several others with seemingly nothing setting it apart, that caught Eric's attention. Every coffee bar in the area used the same machine to make products, but this bar was serving a disproportionately large number of patrons. What set it apart was simple, yet significant. Instead of pumping the piston of the coffee machine just once before releasing the coffee, during the brewing process, the operators at this bar pumped the piston several times. The repeated motion allowed for a higher level of oxidation that drew out more flavor from the coffee beans and it produced better crema, the foam that sits atop a good espresso. Eric was completely taken by this method and upon returning to his home in Switzerland, he would begin developing the Nespresso system. The system consisted of a sealed pot of coffee that maintained the freshness of the product and a brewing machine. The high-pressure brewing system imitated the repeated pumping of the Roman coffee bar, ensuring the heightened aeration of the product and an impressive crema. By the very next year, in 1976, Nestlé would file its first patent for a single-serve coffee system, revolutionizing the world of kitchen appliances for years to come. Revolution, it seemed, was a slow process. The development and fine-tuning of the first Nespresso system would take a decade, only becoming available in 1986. A far cry from the personal coffee maker that it is today, it was initially marketed as an office coffee machine. Unfortunately, Nespresso would fail to find many willing customers in those early days. It would seem that success was not something that they could brew quickly. Up until then, Nespresso's parent company Nestlé had always been known for its affordable goods. High-end Italian espressos weren't really part of that brand. The lackluster success of the product further bolstered the points of the naysayers. Perhaps there just wasn't a market for Nespresso. Then, in 1988, two years into Nespresso's underwhelming voyage and 12 years into development, one man would turn the entire ship around. Jean-Paul Gallard was brought in by Nestlé in an effort to breathe new life into Nespresso. While Eric Favre was credited as the creator of Nespresso, it is Jean-Paul Gallard that is to thank for its success. Gallard believed that the original positioning of Nespresso on the market had been a misstep. Nespresso was not destined to be an office coffee company. Under Gallard, it would become the Chanel of coffee. Gallard's plan was simple. In his own words, Nespresso should be for the level of people who have a doorman. He started with jacking up the prices of the coffee pots and slashing the price of the machines themselves. He then gave out licensing rights to prominent brands, lending Nespresso the familiarity needed to reach a new consumer base. Brands like Termix, Krups, and Alessi opened the doors to Nespresso being stocked in high-end stores like Harrods and reaching richer customers. That was where George Clooney came in, building the Nespresso name. Through a series of advertisements starring George Clooney and Gallard's new Club Nespresso, which was joined automatically by ordering their capsules, Nespresso was able to build a persona of being more than just a coffee. It was a lifestyle. While Nespresso certainly created a niche for itself by positioning the brand as luxury instead of a run-of-the-mill coffee machine, competition was still unavoidable, especially on a global scale. 
and American consumers had been introduced to the coffee capsule most famously through the Keurig. At one point, it felt like every American owned a Keurig. With the host of flavors and disposable capsules, coffee was more convenient than ever with the Keurig. However, as public awareness of the environment and pollution increased, that same convenience would become the downfall of the company. The massive negative environmental impact of single-use plastic coffee pods used by millions each day was something that the public had become less than keen to ignore, and Nespresso, of course, noticed. They used Keurig's public feedback to craft a cleaner, greener image for themselves that positioned Espresso over their competition right as they entered the market. While the origins and growth of the company may seem as clean-cut as any other brand, Nespresso and its parent company Nestle have never quite managed to be as clean and green as they purport to be. Anyone even slightly familiar with Nestle as a company could attest to the complete disregard for the environment that the brand practices. It should then come as a bit of a shock that Nespresso was named the most sustainable coffee company of 2021, but that can be owned to the brand's talent for positioning their public image. Another word for this is greenwashing, or the act of making a product seem more eco-friendly than it actually is. At its core, underneath the glitzy luxury image the brand has curated, Nespresso is a single-serve coffee product that uses capsules of coffee that are discarded after the cup has been made. With over 14 billion capsules sold each year, and only an estimated 5 to 28 percent actually recycled, thousands of tons of Nespresso waste goes straight to landfills, hardly an environmental miracle. Even with the capsules made from aluminum instead of plastic, it only brings into the light further questionable practices that the brand has engaged in. The process of mining aluminum is not an easy one, requiring lots of resources and producing a fair share of toxic byproducts. If the process itself wasn't dubious enough, their mining partner certainly is. The Rio Tinto Group is the world's second largest mining corporation, and as massive corporations are wont to do, Rio Tinto is riddled with controversy. Much like Nestle themselves, Rio Tinto possesses a certain disregard for environmental, labor, and human rights, racking up countless violations across the board, such as their failure to clean up an old mining site blamed for poisoning a number of rivers in Papua New Guinea. On top of all that, the company has also never shied away from engaging in bribery and corruption to ensure favorable outcomes for their projects. Even taking into account the mountain of allegations against Rio Tinto, a corporation of their scale paired with Nestle Nestle's own resources should have no problem achieving their goals, which is true up until their sustainability commitments are considered. Nespresso, a master of marketing, very publicly committed to sourcing 100% sustainable aluminum for their capsules by 2020. The decision garnered them tons of positive press, and consumers were happier than ever to purchase products that would help the environment. Of course, when Nespresso and Rio Tinto failed to meet these goals, no such announcement was ever made. Still, Nespresso somehow snagged the title of 2021's most sustainable coffee company. On the surface, if one were able to gloss past that blatant environment and human rights disasters of their mining efforts, it makes sense. After all, Nespresso's most recent reports state that more than 93% of their coffee is sourced sustainably through their AAA Sustainable Quality Program. What the report fails to mention, however, is that Nespresso sets their own sustainability standards, which are not publicly available for review, and are certified by an organization known for its low standards and covering up violations. It's easy to have a perfect report card when you're the one grading the papers, and Nespresso has gotten away with their low standards for labor, environmental, and even human rights by ensuring that they are always the one passing the judgment. Despite its marketing as luxury coffee that cares about the planet, Nespresso is a master of publicly overcommitting to green initiatives and privately falling short. However, with the aid of greenwashing and the endless coffers of Nestle backing it, it is unlikely that we will ever truly see the fall of Nespresso.